uh, we'd like to welcome our speaker today, uh, Kevin Aguatza. He's a gameplay programmer at Studio Gobo out of Brighton, UK, working on an unannounced AAA game. Uh, treasurer at Game Workers Unite uh, UK. In chat, you can ask Kevin about the state of unionization in the global games industry, how unions may affect the game industry, um, things like that. So we're going to try to steer clear out of um, away from uh, topics that involve very specific, you know, country based labor laws. So if you could uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, so if Kevin, if you're ready, uh, yeah, sure. want to take the first question. All right, the first one comes from Grant Chen, who says, uh, I'm okay with my working conditions, but I'm worried about the industry as a whole. Should I be trying to push for unions at my current job or should I try to help others unionize? What actions should I take? Great question. Right. Um, so I think it's very, very good that you wanna like help make the industry a better place. Um, and I think like in your situation, the first thing you might do is to just go to your work colleagues and you know speak to them and ask them how they feel about the job, what the problems are, how things are going, and just try to get a get a, get a an oversight, an overview of like what the problems and, and like um, positive things are that your colleagues have to say about your work, and sort of get an overview about are there particular groups of people that have particular issues, you know. Uh, certain minorities or women or other or a particular department like maybe you know the team lead of the program is, is a very different management style let's say than maybe the, the lead game design and sort of trying to figure out in your own company speaking just to your colleagues sort of casually you know how do they feel about work what are the issues and what might they be able to do about it as somebody in the past tried to like uh, improve something or go to HR or start a like maybe a, a group for women or something like that. It's something that happened in the past. How did it go? Why did it fail? Why did it succeed? And sort of try to work out how your workplace is structured and where the issues are and how trying to figure out how you can improve it with your colleagues. And then that's sort of the very, very first step of organizing. Um, at some point, you might decide, hey, I need help with like legal advice on manpower or. or you know, capacities, so you might get in contact with a union or decide to join a union with your colleagues, and then a union will help you do that, what I just described, more effectively and more streamlined. Great. Uh, we have another question from uh, Kabir Sef. Uh, how do you feel about game developers not being given overtime pay due to them being exempt from FLSA? Would the union try to make changes to this law? Mm -hmm. I am slightly in the specific law a bit, okay. um, but yeah. it's fine. But in, in like in general, so that uh, most of the time in institutes unpaid. I think it was like three quarters out of at in 2017 in a survey, but I might be slightly off there. And it also sort of depends on the country and local labor laws, right? Some countries overtime is mandatory, and some countries it's not. But one situation we run into, particularly in the in the UK, is that we have. Uh, um, workers that are wrongly classified, for example, as um, zero contractors or just contractors, uh, when really they should be classified as, as employees and get the full benefits. One of the things you went into is situations where you might fight to get you reclassified from being, you know, an outside contractor with no overtime pay into being a full employee with maybe statutory overtime pay. There's one avenue you might get about, go about doing that. Um, or this other other things that might be happening, especially with like huge, um, long periods of overtime, you can run into, in the UK, for example, into super hard labor law violations on break time and rest periods. Like, for example, in a 14 day time spin, you need to have at least one entire day where not working at all. If you come in the office for six, uh, sorry, for seven days straight, Monday to Sunday, then you do the same day the next week. It's a hard, hard break time violation in the UK. And, you know, there are legal avenues, but we usually don't start with like the full lawsuit legal avenue. You know, we try to talk to other people at the company, as I said, and it's very figure out, are other people working overtime? Is it unpaid? How much do they work? Do some people get paid and other people not? 
Um, do some people get paid more over time than others? We had an interesting case where in a language translation, um, sort of Nordic, Nord, Nord European languages were paid at a higher rate than South European languages, which uh, there were cases in the past where that was a basis for like a discriminatory uh, suit based on sort of discrimination towards more uh, believe in sovereign languages being paid differently in, in like um, rates. Um, but sort of the puzzle would be trying to figure out, try to get an overview of what's happening in the tech company and got the overtime pay. Um, then approach management just informally. Uh, um, probably you might do that. Then the union approaching management informally and saying, okay, this is the state and we might, and we think there might be uh, a case for a lawsuit or another avenue or there, have been a, there has been a clear violation in the past and here's what we will do if you don't fix it. And then, you know, we slightly escalate bit by bit into maybe doing a full-blown lawsuit or something else. Mm. Uh, maybe, you know, sometimes even bosses don't really know labor law all that well, especially in big international companies. So sometimes they're like, oh, I didn't know that you couldn't do that. So you just need to sort of poke and say, hey, what you're doing here is really not okay. And then they're like, oh, sometimes that does happen. <laughs> Bosses don't know everything. Let's uh, keep that in mind. Uh, Olivia Schwierz asks, uh, any best practices for someone new to the industry who has concerns about reported working conditions? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I think if you like, sort of before your first job, you're looking for a first job and you don't have like many industry contacts, it's hard to like get get access to this rumor mill, right? Where people are just sort of casually at conferences that, you know, in Corona times don't really exist in the same way. Uh, or local meetups, they just, you know, talk about their workplace. And usually I'd say that um, if you're interested in a job or a location, you know, go there, go to like local events, go to conferences, try to speak to people, figure out what they think about their employer. And usually after like a beer or two, they'll tell you a lot, probably more than they should. Um, it's a, bit, a little bit harder to do, you know, it's Corona. People don't usually just gather in large masses anymore. Um, so you can, and this happened to me, um, you know, somebody just hit me up on LinkedIn and I was like, hey, can I ask you a couple of questions about your company? Do you like it then? And I was like, sure. I have that person out. You can try to identify people that work there, try to speak to them, see what they think. If you're already working there, you know, it's a larger company, um, as I said, this might be entirely possible that certain apartments or locations or buildings or other sort of splits are, have very different conditions and issues than other ones. So it's always good to, you know, speak to your colleagues, especially more diverse ones. You know, if you're a man, try to speak to some women. If you're a white person, try to speak to some people of color and see what they're experiencing like at a company to get a better overview about sort of the entire company culture. Great. Uh, great question so far. Uh, keep them coming. I'll try to get them all in here. Uh, this one's from Becky Grady. Uh, there are so many different roles in the games industry, developers, designers, project managers, community, uh, et cetera, who have very different needs and challenges. Are current initiatives looking to unionize games industry workers as a whole or focusing, focusing on one area, such, you know, specifically one discipline? Um, right. And how will that choice affect the contracts, expectations, timelines, et cetera? Sure. Um, I think the situation at least was that the, the sort of small bits of the games industry internationally that have been unionized for a longer time, usually very specific roles that are sort of coming from other industries, like um, after, before they merged with SAC to become SAC after in the US, they had their first interactive media agreement, right? They didn't even use the term video games back then, in 1993, sort of laying out the conditions for voice actors to work in interactive media slash the games industry. And that's nearly 30 years ago. Oh my God. Wow. It's nearly 30 years ago, um, but it's a long time ago. And you know, you have voice actors, motion capture artists, sometimes writers, um, or other like more specific um, you know, people that have specific skills that are applicable to modern games industry literally oftentimes come from outside with existing union experience membership 
into the games industry. And I think that it has worked to some to to a certain degree for you know if you happen to have that very specific skill set. Um, but the plan or what you see the new unions coming up, um, Gaming Center UK in the UK, um, it's part of the AWGB, uh, Gaming Center Ireland in Ireland, as part of the Financial Services Union, uh, Games Workers Finland as part of a Finnish term that I forgot, and as well as the union um, SCJB, which, which popped up recently in France, they all aim to unionize the entire industry across disciplines, well, to, to a certain degree. We had discussions about like, what about people in esports, professional esports players, uh, games journalists, uh, contractors, people working in finance, people working, people working in the cafeteria of your building, you know, helping to make environment conductive to making good games. Um, where do we sort of draw the line? And at least in UK, we said, okay, everybody who works at a company that makes games uh, or a department that makes games predominantly, they can join the union. Um, so there could be a writer, an artist, a programmer like I am or whatever. Um, the idea being that um, first of their strength and solidarity, the more people um, across the company or the more employees across the company are uh, like trying to achieve something, easier it gets, right? There's power, there's strength in, in, in ha being part of a large group. Um, but also, uh, there, there are some, you know, there's concerns about like people, different disciplines can have very, very different experiences. And external contractor working in QA for a company at maybe slightly above min minimum wage, hopefully, is a very different experience to a very highly paid programmer. But if they are part of the same union and they're pulling or pushing in the same direction, um, they can lift each other up, right? And it's very important to us that especially the worlds that have, uh, you know, are traditionally a little bit more pushed aside uh, um, are being empowered by the people who traditionally have a little bit more power and like um, bargaining room uh, with the company. So that's why we, that's why I think recent initiatives all are starting out trying to go for as wide um, of a group of people working games as possible to get as much um, power uh, to negotiate and to not leave anyone behind that has already traditionally been left behind. Excellent. Uh, next one comes from Joanna Thomas who asks, uh, will unions help the issues uh, concerning lack of diversity in the games industry, including like harassment issues and hiring diversity issues? Right, it's a good question. And I don't think it's a set answer, but I think they can if they set out to do it, right? Um, you know, they have been unions in the past. If you look at, let's say, early 19, uh, 1900s in America, where you know, union were, unions were maybe perpetuating white supremacy and didn't allow any black people to join while still getting benefits for the white union members. Um, so there can definitely be a tool that sort of uh, circles in a, a privileged group to give them more benefits while leaving other people out. But if you, if you try to avoid it, if you try to push for a structure or for a, for a union that actually plans to do an increase diversity and stuff. There's lots of things you can do. I'm looking, for example, at, at a lot of the um, organization that has been happening in games writing, uh, like Vice or other places in the US, where in their bargaining contract, they push very hard to get the company to spend more money on diversity or have better reporting processes for sexual harassment. Or I think Singapore's a Vice Media, but they especially push to give trans employees a better healthcare because they usually have higher medical needs than non-trans employees. And if you, and if it's a goal that you set, and it's a priority for, for the union as a whole, then I think it can be a very strong tool to achieve that. Um, but they don't necessarily have to be. And there are bad examples. A police union will, will not probably make the US police much more diverse and friendly. 
but it still like gives this particular group of pol- of police officers a lot of power that maybe they shouldn't have, but it's a different discussion. But I think, yeah, unions are a tool to achieve something. And what you achieve with them really depends on how the union is made up and who's in it and who's not. Great. Uh, moving on, next one, getting some upvotes. Uh, one from Andrew Ross, who asks, uh, what can press and players do to help workers unionize? All right, that's interesting. So I think in recent years, um, since maybe 2017, we really started going as sort of the international gamers first, reporting on labor conditions, you know, a Rockstar or Riot Games or um, other places. And I think it's very good and supporting people know that. But to some degree, lots of people in the games industry do already know that. Uh, so it's really, so that really helps like bring these issues to, to the players, to the people who play games, um, to be more informed. Now, I don't think that will sort of result necessarily in like boycotts or anything like that. I don't think boycotts based on labor conditions are a viable strategy in this industry, but it helps raise awareness. And particularly in this age of brands and branding, nobody wants to be sort of associated with a bad brand. So that can help, that awareness can help push companies to do better to to preserve this sort of brand image um well translated into brand image goes directly to profit margins to some degree right um so that that is good um but it's also i i i, I personally fear the idea that if you just keep reporting month for month on oh, this company has bad conditions or this company has bad conditions then people will sort of just accept that as the baseline and this should be expected like when you get to the point where people aren't surprised anymore that they are bad conditions, they just sort of accepted them because that's the only thing they hear about that might lead to sort of people getting numb to the problems, which um, that's why I think it's important to also not only sort of focus on the problems, but sort of focus on the people who are trying to solve them. I, I very much enjoyed the reporting on the Riot Games walkout um, and the whole sort of movement and happening around that. And you can compare that one to one to, I think, five years earlier, 2015, when there was a walkout at Crytek, because Crytek, I think, in England, did not pay wages for a bit. So we just didn't show up to work. They walked out of Crytek because they weren't getting paid to work. Um, and they were supporting sort of on that. But if you compare that reporting to reporting what the walkout at Riot Games, it's night and day on focus on the people doing the actual organizing on the ground. Ooh, you might hear that in the background, something is going on here. Um, but just the, setting a focus on the people affected and the people trying to help themselves rather than just that the issue is sort of, well, there is an issue that exists. End of article. Yeah. Great. Uh, how about this one is interesting. It's from Gabe uh, Pofker. Uh, what role can worker-owned cooperative studios play in supporting unions and unionization? Do you have any thoughts on that, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, I, I think work on cooperatives, uh, at least in my opinion, sort of the, for at least you know small-sized companies, sort of the ideal form. Um, uh, but. I also don't think that right in the next decade or two, everybody's going to switch to being a worker on cooperative. I don't see the worker on DA coming without a grander sort of cultural or labor revolution driving them towards that. So I think that if you're starting out trying to form a new company, that it might be a very viable model you want to look at to A, uh, have a fairer company structure, but also B, have a more attractive company structure because getting direct part ownership of a company, part ownership of the profit, that makes people more invested. And if people are more invested, I think they will do better, it will do better work. Um, um, so, but also, um, you know, if you are in a very big company or an international company or a company, it's just too unwieldy to have everyone be a part owner. Then I think it's where union would slot in with a collective bargaining agreement, right? Um, where, wider employees, the wider employeeship is part of the union that sets out, 
or negotiates a collective bargaining agreement with the company that sets out um, uh, working conditions, reimbursements, bonus pay, and that kind of stuff for everybody working at the company. Um, so, and sort of, you know, applies for everybody, but slightly depending on which country and but collective bargaining agreements can just apply to everybody working at the location um, and even new people joining and that kind of stuff. Um, I remember talking once to an, the owner of a small indie company who said like, you're know, talking about like, yeah, what happens if your product, your small product just blows up and becomes hyper successful? Uh, how much if a small company is just, you know, based on gentlemen's agreements and sort of vague kind of sendings that things should be fine. But, you know, you saw a million dollars at any group of people and, you know, these sort of gentlemen, nice, nice social rules and regulations start breaking down. So, um, so I said to him that maybe he wants to just, it might be benefit in having a union for collective buying agreement. Because A, now the union can worry about making sure that people are happy and he doesn't have to worry as much about making sure that people are happy and figuring out what their issues are. The union will do that for, for him and negotiate with him to make sure people get what they want. Um, but also, if the collective buying agreement contains rules about, hey, profit shares or things like that, that the people, that the employees has cut themselves and worked out and bargained for, that sort of means that the employees will have a, will feel like that is sort of fair and the feeling of fairness that you have if you're if you're part of a worker on cooperative cooperative can sort of be replicated by adding these sorts of things into a collective buying agreement of the company as a whole. Great. Uh Tobias Eisner asks, uh, as the industry is quite global and unions usually are bound to national laws, uh, how could this problem be addressed for our industry, uh, creating one inter international standard and avoiding the fragmentation as it is common in other industries? So how can this be more of an international uh, movement and not be fragmented? Mm, that's a very good point. There are some few unions that try to operate entirely globally. Uh, the International Workers of the World, the AWW, is one that tries to do that. But, you know, as the person said, in specific countries, you got specific labor laws you need to incorporate in specific things. Probably membership and probably membership currency are split. So uh, uh, it's not really like one entirely global organization, but they try as much as they can to push towards that, uh, which I think is an interesting idea. But um, um, I always spoken a lot about like, or we think about unions often as, if the industry is global and we think of unions often as also global or maybe national, it's entirely possible that a union for a company of 20 people in the UK, a union is just for that one company and we're always about that one company. Um, like lots of unions, you know, spring up uh, back in the day where like particular companies or, you know, miners in one mine had issues. So they unionized to make the issues at that mine be better. And I think on that level, you maybe don't need to worry about the international. You can just worry about your own particular issues at the workplace. But of course, in, in this globalized economy, there's the threat of outsourcing or, um, um, you know, if you're, or the, or if you're part of a big international company, then they might decide to shut that location down and outsource to somewhere else is a sweat um, that a lot of people have. Sort of, if you, or if you push too far, if you demand too much, they might just make the whole thing go away. To which they say, well, nobody like opens up a studio, an office building in San Francisco and hires highly paid engineers to then immediately sort of hosting away once they start demanding a little bit more. Maybe start demanding a little bit more for the people who aren't as highly paid as they are. Um, um, but I've been going around Europe a bit in the, in the recent couple of years, being to unions in Sweden and Denmark, France, Finland. Um, and there, I remember I was talking to a, a member of Unionen, which is sort of the biggest Swedish union as a whole and Sweden being a very unionist country in general, big union membership, you know, telling me that they have enough like 
money in a war chest so that every single member of the union could go on strike for multiple years and not get paid anything. They have that war chest that allows them to have a lot of bargaining power because they can literally strike for forever, essentially. Um, versus we, as a very new union, we do not have a war chest that big where you can pay everybody salaries in full for years. Uh, um, but um, again, sort of going slightly back to, to the Riot Games, Walker, you know, you did see the solidarity of people um, working at other locations. And I think in Dublin, in Ireland, there was also a, a walkout by people over there on solidarity. And uh, and I think in this more globally connected world, it's much easier for struggles in one region or one arm of the company to reach people working at other, in other regions or other parts of a company and to have solidarity action across the globe. Um, it's much easier than it was, you know, before the digital age. So I think there's definitely the possibilities to coordinate and cooperate across borders. Um, and again, just as we said, okay, we want to get as much different people inside of a union. So the more privileged people that can help the less privileged people, whatever the particular form of privilege may be. Same is true for cross borders. If multiple unions across borders of a company cooperate, then if the highly paid engineers in San Francisco can stand in solidarity with them, maybe definitely you know, there's highly paid QA testers in, uh, in India. Um, that very much can help with bargaining power and improving the situation. Great. All right. We have about two minutes left. Let's try to get two more in. Uh, there's one from, just came in from Ryan Lippert. Um, what, if anything, could I do between now um, and when this person uh, graduates uh, law school shortly? Uh, what can they do between now and then to get some relevant experience in this area? And are there any specific reading recommendations? person's interested in getting getting into this subject mm. Mm. reading recommendations uh, and law school uh, I just assume from the term law school that it's about the US uh, in which case the, what you should do as a lawyer in the US sort of outside of my my knowledge but when it comes to sort of general reading recommendations uh, I know you can show a book in camera uh, secret, yeah. right? Nope. Uh, Secrets of a Successful Organizer by Labor Notes. Um, there's a book that say, sort of lays out, okay, how do I approach how do I approach organizing my workplace from sort of start to finish? What are things to look out for? What are you know things that organizers have learned over the the decades of organizing? Um, and uh, this book, as well as like other books by Labor Notes. Um, are very good resources about organizing um, when it comes to legal resources. Well, I guess kind of familiar with the National Labor Relationship Act. But as I said in the beginning, that's sort of outside of my realm yeah. of knowledge. I think that's probably all, all they need. They want a little uh, resource. And then we'll, we'll, we'll go over where you can find uh, Kevin um, and uh, his organization online. Let's try to get this one in. Uh, Gabriel uh, uh, Mikkel, sorry, pronunciation. I don't have the temperament to organize or lead a union. However, I would like to join one. Am I doomed to a unionless country if most everyone is like me? Uh, what can I do to still contribute? Unionless make country. Make it a quick one. <laughs> well, I would say there's no country that is entirely unionist. If you want to join a union, there's only one in your country that would accept you. And I could maybe help you get started on doing more. But, you know, in general, if there's a union you can join, you know, money does definitely help people to do stuff. Uh, I know that very much as a treasurer, having money allows, you know, allows us to ha take on pro bono cases or work with lawyers and do all kinds of stuff. So just, you know, joining a union and paying the membership fees will definitely help them. Um, if everybody thinks like that, um, but I think that's something that's definitely changing across uh, the industry. More and more people are firstly becoming aware of unionization and be becoming positive to unionization. And I think as the decade will go on, um, you will see a huge shift in public industry opinion about unionization. All right, great. 
Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been really insightful, uh, it, like for me as well. Thank you to everyone who showed up and asked these great questions. If people want to contact uh, you or GW UK for more info, uh, what's the best way to do it, Kevin? Uh, again, I think the GC description has my Twitter handle. Yeah, yeah, check uh, out the, which... uh, the uh, description down there. Yeah, so I'm like sort of speaker bio, my Twitter handle, or uh, um, you know, just googling my name. It's kind of a unique name, apparently, so you'll probably find me. <laughs> um, when it comes to to like connecting us, uh, I used to again say we've got local meetings over the country, come to one, but not during Corona. So you now go to our website and you can contact us there, or you know, hit up the Gaming Saint UK Twitter. Uh, yeah, you no. Know, Anyway, you want. Yeah. All right. Great SEO. Uh, so uh, thanks again. And uh, I'll see you all around. Thanks. Bye.